Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory, the video series where we talk a lot about random things like random variables or random distributions. And indeed in today's part 33 I want to start to talk about statistics. In particular we start with the so-called descriptive statistics which means we have notions like median, sample mean and related stuff. However, as always, before we start with the definitions, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, you can download a lot of additional material with the link in the description. For example, you find quizzes, exercises and the PDF versions for the videos. With that said, let's immediately go to the topic of today, which is in general just statistics. This means after all the discussions about definitions of probabilities and random variables and how to model different random experiments, we completely change the point of view now. With statistics we want to extract information from a given set of data. And there I can already tell you we have two kinds of statistics. The first one is what we call descriptive statistics and the second kind is usually called inferential or inductive statistics. And I would say the names already tell us what the difference is because the descriptive statistics just describes what we see and have in the data. And on the other hand with the inferential statistics we try to do some deductive reasoning to get out more information about data we don't have. Therefore this is actually the part where the whole mathematics and probability theory comes in. But before we start with that I first want to give you the basics of the descriptive statistics as well. This means that this video will not be so complicated because we just talk about some basic definitions. And the first notion is what we call a sample which is just a finite set of data points. So in the mathematical setting this means that we just have a finite set of chosen real numbers. And there what we imagine is that they are chosen in some sense randomly from a much larger set of data. And how we call that depends a little bit on the application or the context but we could say it's all the theoretically possible data where we only have a small sample of it. So for example if you want to know what people think of a given political question this would be our whole population but you can only ask a smaller selection of people. And there statistics comes into the game because now we can analyze our given sample. And moreover summarizing and visualizing all the data we have is usually what we put into the descriptive statistics. So you see this is quite important and it's something the inferential statistics can use as well. So for example there we could say that the inferential statistics tries to find the underlying probability distribution. And this leads to a prediction for the whole population for the real world. And at this point you should see that the probability theory comes in again because such a prediction should have a probability. This makes sense because we don't have the full information everything we predict should be quantified by a probability. However there you might already feel that different approaches could be possible and this is definitely something we will talk about in later videos. In this video here we keep it simple because we just want to talk a little bit about the basic definitions in descriptive statistics. And first let's set the meaning of a sample in RD. And as already mentioned this is just a finite collection of points chosen from Rn. We can call them x1, x2, x3 and so on but please keep in mind every point here represents a whole vector in RD. And I say RD because the finite sample set here should end with the index n. So this is already it, we just have a finite set with vectors in RD. And usually we say we have a tuple so we have an ordered set. So the size of the sample is n and n is a fixed natural number. Ok so this is how we collect our data and then we can just say that we have a sample of size n. And now for example you can imagine that we collect body heights of people and then we don't need a vector we just need a real number. This means if we measure n people we get a sample of size n and we have n numbers in our tuple. However in the real number line we have an ordering so we could rearrange our measurements here such that they are increasing. 
Hence, we could make it that nothing is smaller than x1 and then comes x2 and so on. In other words, we just rename the elements from our sample. Of course, this helps a lot if we want to visualize the whole sample, because we can just go from the left to the right on the number line. So let's say here is our real number line, and now we can put this sample on top. So maybe here the first one is x1, then x2 might be next to it, x3 here, and so on. And there you see the ordering really helps, because now we can just name all the elements from left to right. So here we have x12, then x13, and so on. So the last one here is x15, so our n is 15. And obviously this kind of visualization only helps if the size is small enough, because otherwise we don't see anything, we just see points on the number line. And in that case you might already know that a so-called histogram is much better for the whole visualization. And in fact a histogram is just a grouping where points are just put into packages. This means you take the number line and then you say this one is my first box, then comes the second box, and then the third box and the fourth box, and let's say for this example these are all we need. Okay, by having the boxes we can just count how many elements lie inside such a given box. And this quantity is what we put on the y-axis. And then as you know, what we get is this bar chart. So for our example, what we get looks like this. But of course, different partitions for the x-axis here are possible, such that for a given sample, a lot of different histograms exist. So roughly you could say, the correct choice of the grouping here depends on the context. And this immediately leads to the next definition about frequencies. So again, let's say we have a given sample in R as before. And now we also fix a subset A in R as well. So for example, what we have chosen before here was definitely a subset in R. And now counting the elements that fall into the subset gives us the absolute frequency. More precisely, we would say it's the absolute frequency of A. Therefore, let's call it f with index abs. And now the definition is quite simple, it's just the height in the given histogram. So mathematically speaking, the number of indices in the natural numbers, such that xk lies in a. And obviously this works for any subset a in the real number line, and we get a well-defined natural number out. But obviously, if the sample size is really large, this number could also be huge. And therefore it makes sense to normalize everything and just talk about the relative frequency. So we count exactly the same thing, but then we divide by the sample size. So you know, this leads to a real number between 0 and 1. Of course, this is something we want in probability theory. However, please keep in mind we don't talk about probabilities yet, because here we just analyze a given data set. And there you should see, since we have a lot of different subsets in the real number line, we can talk about different frequencies for a given data set as well. Or to say it in other words, you can make the partition for the histogram as fine as you want. However, then we have a lot of frequencies we need to talk about, and therefore it's better to keep it simple. And in fact you might already know this single number that can represent a whole sample, which we now call just x. And this is just the so-called sample mean. And the common notation is just x with an overline. And you also already know, the formula is just given by the arithmetic mean. This means we sum everything up and then we divide by n. So not so complicated, but this is our real number that lies somehow in the middle of the whole sample. So maybe again we try to visualize that, here is our sample, and now we have to add up all the numbers and divide by 15. And then maybe what we get is a real number that has its value here. So this is the sample mean, and please always keep in mind, it does not have to be a point in the sample at all. So it's just an average we can calculate with the given numbers. However, this also means if we push one point really far off, the average really changes. So in this example, the more we push x1 to the left, the average is also pushed to the left. So if we don't want this dependency on a single point, we can define and take the so-called median. Roughly speaking, it's just the middle point in our data set. 
This means if the sample is ordered, we can immediately read our middle point of the sample. Hence in our example it would be x8 and this is what we call m of x. So again, this is the median because we have 7 points on the left hand side and 7 points on the right hand side. Hence for the median it does not matter at all how far x1 actually is off because it's just about the number of data points. So the idea here is quite simple, you just put the data into two groups of the same size. And then we have two cases, either we have a single data point in the middle or there is none. This would be the case when we have an even number of data points, but this is not a problem at all because we can just take the average of the two boundary points. So not complicated at all, we just create a virtual data point in the middle. So you see, in this case, the two endpoints define our median mx. And now you know we can also put this into a mathematical definition where we just distinguish two cases. If n is odd, we can go to the index n plus 1 divided by 2. And this is exactly the middle point if our sample is ordered as we have required before. And now on the other hand, if n is even, we can go to the index n divided by 2. And then we also go to the next one on the right, which would have an increased index by 1. And now you know we just add the two values and divide by 2. And there we have it. This is the definition of the median. So here you can remember the median or the sample mean give us a real number that represents the whole sample. But obviously, by definition, it forgets a lot about the details of the sample. And to catch more about the spread of our data set, we have something we call the variance again. More precisely, it's the so-called unbiased sample variance and I denote it by Sx squared. And as you might already know, it measures the quadratic spread around the sample mean. So for each k we calculate the difference and square it. And then we have to sum them up to get a non-negative real number out. And in the front we have a normalization which we set as 1 divided by n minus 1. And indeed it's not just 1 divided by n because this factor is the correct one to make the sample variance unbiased. What this exactly means we will discuss in a future video, but here you might already guess that the sample variance is something we want to use to estimate the real variance of the underlying probability distribution. In other words, this formula already leads to our inductive statistics we want to do in future. So in the next videos we will go deeper into the field of statistics, which is quite interesting. So I really hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.